This is a prickly pear margarita. I don't usually like my margaritas blended, but my guest today, Michael Vartan, actor and fellow hockey enthusiast, has given me the nickname Blender, which we'll get into later. So I kind of felt obligated to blend this cocktail. All we need is lime juice, simple syrup, Casamigos Blanco. Gotta go with the best. And a little bit of prickly pear puree. I've never had prickly pear, so this will be fun. Preferably one without artificial sweeteners. This is a very exciting episode for me because I grew up watching Mike on all five seasons of ABC's hit show Alias. I'm a huge fan, I am fortunate enough to call him a dear friend, and he's one of my favorite hockey teammates. I'm Riker Lynch, and this is Glass Half Full. All right. Uh, uh, are, we, are, we, are we rolling? Yeah, we're, we're, this, is, this is go time, man. What, we're here. Where's the hair and makeup people? <laughs> no? No. Oh. We don't know. No. Sorry. We're, we're low budget. Oh, okay. Here. Cool. So you look great, though. Oh, thanks. thanks. Mike, Michael Vartan. Appreciate it. Where's Thank my, you. I should have a little umbrella thing. We should have. I should have done it. No, that's, 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 this is, this is, look, that's, it's clean and simple. I like, you know what? I, I wanted to keep it simple because we got the Kings logo yes, in here. I like it. So I probably should garnish with we are all kings. or something, though. That's right. Cheers. Cheers, man. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Thank you Appreciate for being it. here. Mmm. Mmm. So. I, um, when we first moved out here, we were looking for a place to play hockey and we found the, our little spot and you're skating out there and, um, we, I grew up watching Alias. Mm -hmm. So it was like the coolest thing in my book <laughs> that you were out there and that you played hockey. Cause you were easily, you know, our favorite character, the whole family, like we watched it as a family uh -huh. and, um, we just... I, it was the coolest moment to be like, oh my god, that's so funny. I didn't Michael know you never told me that. That's yeah, hilarious. I, I I didn't want to like be like too fangirly. <laughs> so I and I'm I'm glad that we saved. Uh, I saved a couple of those, but literally it was uh, a huge, huge show. We watched the whole thing. Oh, that's awesome. And um, when you were there, it was it was so cool. And then the first thing you ever said to me, or at least the first thing that I remember, uh -huh. is um, during the game we were on a we were on the same team, and I, it was like towards the end of the shift or something. So I was like kind of lollygagging on the back check and you passed me and you were like you got to get back kid <laughs> did i say that? yep that was the first just... that was the first thing you said and i was just like michael Vartan said something to me oh, <laughs> and i was so That's pumped hilarious. and yeah that was uh oh, that was like yeah. teenager riker you know not really um fully understanding by the way, trying to motivate someone who's three times faster than me in a pickup game in Burbank. That's 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 where I was at mentally. It's awesome. But it was life goals. It, it was fun and I and I, I got a kick out of it and I didn't I didn't you know, I wasn't upset or anything by no, any no. means. But it was I just thought it was um really funny. That's hilarious. That we were you know, and, and now, you know, I, I understand a, a lot more about the the, the center role in hockey. And right. Yes, so. you do. Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. So now I'm good. And I, I that, you know, I could give you credit to that as, as being like making sure I get back well, every time. If I can take 1% uh, credit for the player you've turned into, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I don't know if I'd like playing with you more as much as I hate playing against you. <laughs> because Thank playing you. against you, as you mentioned in the kitchen, your nick I gave you the nickname The Blender, because playing with against you is like being trapped in a blender. Thank That's you. what I feel like. I feel there's sticks and, and elbows and everything. And you're a clean player. You've never hit me, you've never slashed me, but Thank you. normally I get the puck in, in the corner, I look up, I, option A, B, oh, yeah, I'll go with C. I get the puck with you, and it's like, Jesus, where did he come from? He was like 300 feet away five seconds ago. This can't be happening. That's funny. Yeah, how so, did yeah. that, that, how did, was there a moment where you thought of the blender name? Because I don't remember that. I don't remember the origin yeah, it, of that. It was, it was, I think it was a, uh, a period of maybe two or three games where your game just, you know, improved exponentially, and, and you went from being, a, you were always super fast. But you went from being super fast to now super aggressive in terms of understanding the, the entire game. Mm -hmm. And that's when I thought, oh, God, we are screwed. <laughs> this is not going to be fun for whoever's playing against you. I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about you, man. I, uh, I'm a big fan. Thank you. Of, all, of all your stuff. Um, I'm about halfway through the first season of The Arrangement huh. right now. And I actually really, really enjoy it. I think I really like your character. I think there is so much more that meets the eye that you're just sort of like you know <laughs> hiding underneath and it's very intriguing it's very fun to watch he's a he's a weird dysfunctional uh manipulative egomaniacal bad guy yeah who used to be a good guy 
Um, and it is, it's a really fun character to play because my entire career I've been kind of cast as the boyfriend or the, mm -hmm. you know, the guy next door or the, the you know, romantic comedies. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, those, when you, it, it's work when you can get it and it's fun. And I've got, because of those, I got to work with, you know, Drew Barrymore and J-Lo and right. Jane Fonda. So it's, I've, I've met some really incredible people. But as an actor, I'm sure you'll, you'll relate. It's the dark stuff that's really interesting. You know? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to play the Ken doll in the corner with a perm smile on his face. I want to play <laughs> a, a disturbed guy who's got, got some issues. And, and for me as an audience member, I'm always much more intrigued in, in, in watching people fail and, and, and struggle and watching their redemptive, redemptive stories or right. you know, overcoming their, their, their dark side. Um, he's, he's not quite that dark because you know, the show's on E, so it's not HBO. We can't, we right. can't push the envelope too far, but it's definitely the first, the first role I've been uh, able to do where I get to do something else and just be like, hi! You're right. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah, so but it, it, I mean, it shows your range. I mean, you got a lot in there. Especially like the, just the little subtleties on the arrangement. Like every, there's always, um, there's always like a, a good pause and you can, I just see it in your eyes and there's just like, there's something mm. going on here that we don't know yet. And it, I'm really excited to watch the rest well, of it. Well, I'll tell you, and as you know, because you, you, you're in this business as well, you're what you, quadruple threat acting, singing, uh, bass playing, dancing. <laughs> we, I don't know. Hockey I'm, doesn't count, right? We can't. You can't be. A, it's not. I'm hoping to do a hockey movie. Well, the way you play hockey is almost part of the arts. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you could be a quintuple threat. But uh, <laughs> no, our uh, showrunner, creator, and writer Jonathan Abrahams. He's an amazing writer. He worked uh, on um, Mad Men for like three or four years. He's oh, a great okay. writer, and you know. Thank you for saying those kind things uh, about me and my character, but a lot of times I'll read the script and you know, you know how sometimes the writing's so good that it, it kind of just acts itself for yes. you? You don't have to really think too much. It's so clear and so precise and just so dense with just information. You're like, oh, let's just, let's just go do this. I don't have to think yeah, too much know, about it. Yeah. You know, just yell action, let's go. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been a fun experience. Uh, Shoots in Vancouver, which is a beautiful city. That's what I was, was going to ask. Cause yeah. that, I'm always like, yo, what, you, you playing hockey day? You're like, no, I'm in Vancouver. <laughs> yeah. So that's the one that shoots in Yeah, Vancouver. I mean, there's so many productions up there right now. And they've done actually a really good job at making Vancouver look like L.A., which is tough because yeah, they it, did, it, it rains actually. a lot. Um, I want to talk. I want to get to know a little bit about your process, especially for a darker character like mm -hmm. the one in the arrangement. Um, do you have any like sort of daily rituals or just daily prep you do when you're on set? You know, I usually... I mean, it depends on the character. Like I said, this character is so well written that the minute I read it, I, I kind of felt like I connected with him and I understood him. And I think most actors would have. It, that's how good the script was. Mm -hmm. um, I, I haven't yet been given a role that is so far uh, away from who I am as a person that I've really had to do some serious thinking about, okay, so how would I react if I was dealt this set of circumstances? And you know, most of the stuff is still pretty close-ish to who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. um, but my process is really, you know, I, I don't really know what I'm doing when I'm acting for the most part. You know, I just try to just, my, my thing is I tr try to be as honest with myself as possible. Right. As, as actors, as our artists, you, you spend your time sort of examining the human race and watching people because that's how you learn how human behavior. And ultimately right. that's what you're reproducing. But for me, I, I try to just deliver every line as honestly as I can because I feel like if I believe it, there's a chance the audience will believe it. If you don't believe it, no one else will. So it's not so much a process of, okay, I'm doing this scene today. What do I have to think of? Where, what, what, what happened before the scene? What's happening after the scene? What's my character? All those things are sort of, I, I already know what's going on. And okay. I, just, I just try to, just in every scene, just try and bring as much humanity and honesty as I can. And, um, you know, I. Geez, I've been doing this for thirty years now, so I've I've picked up a few things along. It's pretty along it's the pretty natural for you then. You just it, no, it's just you know, almost feels like I, I you know, there's still some scenes where and I, I, I still haven't figured out what this is all about, but there's some scenes we'll do the scene and the camera the setup the two cameras are there and then they'll switch the two cameras over here and all of a sudden for some reason now I'm nervous. And I wasn't nervous huh. on and I don't know what that is. I I'm not gonna waste money in therapy to figure it out. <laughs> um, but there's still some things that always take me by surprise, um, I've never ever heard a director yell cut and been like, yes, that's it, I nailed it. I've always been like, oh, but could, could we just get the one, I can just... Um, well, maybe that's just part of like the, the, you know, the struggle of the art, is just trying uh, to get it 100%. You know, each time. I, I've, I've said that 
Acting is by far the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I've never felt satisfied as, as, as an actor after a scene. I've always felt like there was more to find. There was, in TV it's tough, as you know. You don't have time to sit around and right. talk about the scene for a couple hours and rehearse it three or four times. You know, you've, you've got six days to shoot an episode, you, you gotta go. Now mm -hmm. we're moving on, we gotta go. Uh, so I think in TV as an actor, you have to do, do a lot of your prep work on your own yeah. before. Whereas in film, you can do your prep work and still have a lot of conversations with the director. Usually you'll go out to dinner with the cast and talk about things and bounce ideas off each other and that's when you can sort of find new things here and there because you have a little more time. But in TV you just have to, you've, you've got to be ready. You've got to prepare yourself and just be ready to go because you don't have time to go like, oh, I have an idea. What if we did it with this? Like, no, no. We don't, how about here's an idea. You just shut up and say your lines. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's uh, on alias Victor Garber, who played uh, Sidney Bristow's father. Okay. Um, he gave me, he's one of my favorite people on the planet, amazing actor, Tony nominated actor. He gave me some advice one day, which he took me aside and said, I'm going to give you some advice. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great. He's going to give me the, ins the, the holy grail. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, you've got to do. And he goes, Your job as an actor is to show up on time, hit your mark, say your line, go back to your trailer, hang up your clothes, shut the fuck up, and go home. <laughs> I was like, wow, <laughs> okay, it, but you know what? It's true, that's yeah. your job, your job is to be on, oh, and he also threw in be courteous to the crew, which is something I take great pride in because we can't do what we do without, without the gaffers or the electrics or the dolly grip or the boom operator. Every single person on that set is as valuable as we are and I hate that culture that is in this business still where the actors show up on set and you know, I mean, I spend literally the first week of every, every job, I spend so much energy befriending the crew, letting them know, hey guys, I'm one of you. I'm just, I yeah. just happen to be on the other side of the list. I don't give a shit about being, it's, this is us. We are all here together. If I'm going fast and, and saying, why do we have to do this again? It's because I want get to get you out on Friday night early too. You know, right. we all have fa families, so. Um, well, that's awesome. That's very courteous just, of you. Well, and you just have to, you're a crew member yeah. who happens to be on the other side of the camera. You know? Absolutely. So it's, uh, I mean, I'm sure you've, encountered many actors that were really cool people and friends and then struggling actors and then they book like a Colgate commercial and they turn into complete divas and they're like, dude, <laughs> It is what? a Colgate commercial. Yeah, yeah. settle down. <laughs> yeah. Settle down. That's funny. Yeah, uh, no, I, I, uh, I definitely um, am on the same page with you and all that and I, I love that you go out of your way to do It's almost a it's hockey important. mentality. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It's, it's like team. The it's fourth, all about the team. Fourth line plugger is just as important as the first line star center. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Well, um, speaking of Alias, um, that was, uh, especially in, in my life, that was a, a, a huge, huge deal. Mm -hmm. What was that like with you? How did that, how did that come about? I did a movie uh, a couple years before um, with Gwyneth Paltrow and David Schwimmer. Uh, the name escapes me now. This is terrible. Uh, <laughs> but J.J. Uh, Abrams and his partner, Jason Katims, Kat uh, wrote it. Oh, okay. So he was on set a lot. We shot that in New York. And about a year and a half later, he called me and he was casting for Alias. And he said, uh, come in, I'm really interested in you playing this, this part, Agent Vaughn. I said, oh, really? Great. So I go into his office. It's just him and I. And I'm a, still to this day, I'm a terrible auditioner. It's the worst. And he goes, here, let's just read the scene. And I start reading the scene and start flop sweating uncontrollably. Oh, I'm really? nervous. Because I know that if I don't do well here, I'm not getting, you know, it's mm -hmm. the next step's not happening. And he was so nice, he was so supportive, and, and just said, no, just relax, you got this. So I went to network, I went to studio, and I somehow got the job. Um, but that's how I got the job. JJ really pushed for me, and then um, uh, that was probably the best experience I've had in my, in, in, in my 30 years doing this. The project itself was awesome It was at the time. fantastic, it was so, it was good. so there, good. There was nothing like that on TV. There was oh, no yeah. kick-ass, strong, female-leading roles like that before. And, and you did like five seasons. Five seasons, yeah. okay. And we had the luxury since we it was network and we shot twenty two episodes a year. So basically, from you know late August to April, um, most of the crew would take the summer off because they knew they were coming back. Yeah. And so we basically had the same crew for f almost five years. Wow. And you spend fourteen hours a day on set with people for you know nine months a year f for five years. You, you create some really deep bonds. I, the last day of Alias, the day we just you know season finale season finale. Everyone was bawling. Oh, I it was, bet. It was the worst. Um, 
yeah, that was an amazing experience. The the, the hours were horrendous because we had to shoot at night a lot because yeah, to make you know downtown Burbank look like Algiers or right or, or <laughs> Mongolia where we were all always on missions and stuff. Uh, we had to shoot at night. San Pete, a lot of San Pedro shoots. You know, you're driving home on Friday morning in bumper to bumper traffic after a 15 hour day, and you have oh. to go back at 5 p.m. the next. Oh, but you dang. don't remember that stuff, you know. In hindsight, it's like, ah, it was all fun. It was yeah. all great, you know. Um, in the moment, you're like, oh, Jesus oh, yeah. Christ! <laughs> Come on, put down the razor. Let's go. You're blocking traffic. Um, but you know, Alias was was awesome, and what a great cast. And we all, it was one of those deals where by the second year, there's this thing called the upfronts where you go to New York right. and mm -hmm. all the cast. I did for, that with Glee. Exactly. We're all there with you know your your castmates, and you're there to promote the show and stuff. In season two, it was Ron Rifkin who played the bad guy. He said, is this real? Are we so lucky to have basically, basically six or seven, uh, you know, uh, lead characters on our show and we all love each other? Yeah. We, I mean, we all got along so well. And, you know, often people ask me, come on, that's, you can't. That's not true, right? right? And it really was. We got along. We hung out outside of work all the time. Do you together. keep in touch with any of them yeah, still? Yeah, Victor, Victor, Victor and I stayed in the same building the last two years I was doing the arrangement. Oh, okay. Just by coincidence. <laughs> it was the weirdest thing. He was um, shooting something else? Yeah, he was uh, doing Ledge. I'm not sure what he was doing. Some, okay. some CW show. Um, but yeah, Victor especially, um, once in a while Kevin Weissman who played the, the tech geek. Mm -hmm. uh, once in a while Jen and I uh, shoot a text, how you doing? But mostly Victor. Uh, Bradley, a lot of people forget that Bradley Cooper was on season one of Alien. Yeah, I yeah. totally knew that. And uh, it's a funny story. We auditioned together. And, you know, during the process, you, on, a, on a Tuesday, you'll read for the studio. On a Wednesday, you'll read for the network. Right. We were both, became kind of friendly after, you know, three days. And right before he went in for the, uh, the network thing, he looks at me and goes, one of us is not getting this job. And I was like, yep, absolutely. There's no <laughs> chance. Because we kind of looked alike, you know, and you know how networks are. They want diversity totally. and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we weren't going up for the same part, right. but we knew that one of us wasn't going to get it because we were too similar, and we both got it. So we were very. That's excited. awesome. Yeah, that was kind of fun. He's a great guy, awesome guy, and obviously turned into quite an incredible actor. Big, big yeah. time. He's yeah. done all right for himself. Well, I, I chose not to take to take that route because I knew I wouldn't be able to play hockey anymore. So I chose not to become <laughs> an international superstar. Yes. I just want to be unknown you and play wanna, hockey. You just want to play hockey. That's I, right. I totally you get, get you. Right? I'm, I'm the same. And way. have drinks on a Friday afternoon. There what you right? go. Look at that. I want to back up really quick. Um, why do you think you're a bad auditioner? I love being open about my experience because I know there are young actors out there who might see this and think, oh, wow, I'm going through the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, I'm a ba bad auditioner for many reasons. Uh, one of them, the pressure of auditioning is very different than the pressure of being on set and shooting. As I you know. completely because agree with this that. Is the this is, it's, it's do or die. This is, you've got one scene or, some, or one or two. And if you suck, it's over. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you've already gotten the job and you suck, you cut and you talk to the director and you fix go it. again and you fix it. Um, I, that pressure was always really hard for me to handle. So I'd get really nervous. And you know, even on jobs where I didn't necessarily really want them or wasn't passionate about them, once you get in the room, you want it. You know? Oh, absolutely. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, now, well, now that I'm here, I really want to do well and I really want to get this job. Um, and actually, one of my uh, acting teachers years ago, this is the best piece of advice I ever got. She told me, uh, you're not the best actor in the world. You're not the worst actor in the world. But the thing you have going for you is that no one on this planet can act the way you can act. And I was like, what? She said, just by virtue of being who you are and your sensibilities and whatever journeys have, have you know, the, the confluence of where you are today, mm -hmm. the way you process a script and say the lines, no one can do it the way you can do it. So in that sense, you will always be unique. So don't worry about being better than the three other guys in the waiting room that look just like you or in your mind are better than you. Just go do your thing because no one can do it the way you can do it. And yeah. if, if the way you do it is what they're looking for, you'll get the job. That's great advice. And that's something that really, it, it took about a, a year or two to, to sink in. And I'll always remember, I walked into this audition one day and it was for like this hitman or something, and you know, because I screamed danger. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they said, uh, you know, black suit, all this kind of stuff. And I didn't have black shoes, and I thought, fuck it. I had this pair of weird old, like, white leather shoes, and I thought, uh -huh. oh, this is kind of interesting. I'll just wear my, whatever. I didn't really even think about it. And of course, I walk in, and the seven other guys are wearing perfectly polished black shoes. And this is the crazy part of the actor's mind. Instead of going, I got this. 
I'm the only one here with white shoes. <laughs> yeah, I went, oh, I'm never going to get this. They all have black shoes. What am I doing here with really? my stupid white shoes? <laughs> you know, and it's, I, most actors have that reaction. It's, yeah. it's more of a self-deprecating, like, oh, God, I should have worn black shoes. I should have at least gone to the, you know, the aardvark and gotten some secondhand shoes or something. Um, That's interesting. But that day, I, I, I'm not going to lie. I wasn't like, oh, I got this. But that day I said, Michael, they might all have nicer shoes, but they can't act the way you can act. Some of them are probably better, some of them are probably worse, but they can't do what you can do, whatever that yeah. is. And in that moment, I just went, all right, let's do this. And I went in, and I did a good job. I didn't get the part, but I walked out going, I did so much better than I would have two years ago without yeah. that advice. So that was, that was a pretty big thing for me. Um, there's a great SNL story. I don't know if it's true. I've heard it so many times now. Um, Tell me if I'm talking too much. No, I love it. Just, Keep going. Okay. There's this great SNL story. I don't know if it's true or not, but apparently Bill Hader and Andy Sandberg auditioned for SNL at the same time, and they rode in the elevator together. And again, a, an insight into the craziness of an actor's mind. And one of them had a box full of props, and the, the other had nothing. And they went in the audition. They both got the part, obviously. And you know, a couple days later, they uh, just sort of um, you know thought back on that elevator ride, and Andy was like. Bill, I gotta say, I walked into the elevator and he had this huge box of props. And I thought, I'm never gonna get this. This guy's amazing. He's like, Are you kidding me? I walked into the elevator. You had nothing. I thought, I'm never gonna get it. He doesn't even need props. He must be amazing. <laughs> so it's that weird. This is you a know, total actor like, thing to do. Yeah, that's so just, funny. Why? Stop, stop beating yourself up. You are unique just by virtue of being you. And, yeah. and the thing also I've learned, uh, I've been lucky enough to be on the other side of casting. I've, I've done a couple jobs where I, I had the lead and the director, one of my. And put on like leading lady or you know best friend chemistry or reads sort yeah, of things exactly and that that experience was really helpful because it shocked me how many times an actor would walk in the room and without even saying a word like nope not happening yeah I or I've, that, someone that would walk in the very room eye opening oh it was amazing it, it was freeing from my point of view I thought my next audition I'll know I'll just do what I do and if it works great if it doesn't doesn't matter what I do if I'm yeah. not right for the part in their eyes I'm not getting it exactly and sometimes someone would walk in and you'd be like oh yes oh, Please be good, and then they'd start acting. And be like, like oh, suck. God, that's <laughs> and then every once in a while, someone walks in, you're like, eh. And then their their reading is brilliant. And you go, well, we've got to hire that person because the right. talent supersedes whatever idea of the character we had. You've got sometimes you just have to go with just raw talent. Right. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't really have a process. I just uh, I don't I don't know if you ever get nervous. I've I've cataloged throughout the 30 years I've been doing this, and so therefore I don't do it anymore. The only times I've ever gotten nervous as an actor is when I didn't know my lines perfectly. Mm -hmm. Because you start thinking, oh, what's my line? Especially on my co-star's coverage, and when the camera's on them, you want to be spot on, because yeah. you want to help their help perform. Help them, exactly. Because if you mess up, if I mess up on my coverage, sorry guys, let's just go again. But if you mess up on your co-star's coverage, like, oh, I'm so sorry, I just ruined this great moment you were having, and yeah. you, you hate oh, doing yeah, that. Yeah, 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 uh, sure. But I found that once, um, once I started pinpointing that that's what made me nervous, I just, I started learning my lines just like a maniac. Yeah. So I know my lines, even when I audition now, I never come in with sight. I know, know my lines. And people say, well, you know, that's not good. They're going to think that this is good, as good as it gets. And I'm like, yeah, this is as good as it, as good as it gets. <laughs> that's it's why I'm doing it. this, yeah. yeah. If this isn't good, good enough, you're not going to see some miraculous transformation on set. This is as good as I am, so either hire me or don't. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm with you on that. I, I, uh, I pride myself in knowing my lines and everybody else is better than they do. Because then, then you're just then you're just in it, mm -hmm. and you don't have to think about it at all. It just flows out, and, and there's much more listening. Absolutely, and, and that that part of your brain that's holding on to what what is my line is now free to think of other things and mm -hmm. be creative, and you know actually do some character work. Exactly, live in the moment, and one of the yeah. greatest compliments I ever got, which is pretty sad, uh, but this guy uh, Tobias, who was uh, our focus puller in season one on the arrangement. Um, by like episode six or seven, he came up to me. He's like, "Michael, you, I, I ne you, I've never seen you hold sides on set." And I was like, "What do you mean? You know, sides. The sides that act. The sides are for your viewers. Or yeah, the many like printouts small of versions. the script, so you can go over your lines." It's like, "Well, yeah, I, I don't need sides. I learned my lines last night. That's that's my my job. They're not paying me to go out and party and then try and learn my lines <laughs> in the trailer hung over the next morning. I learned my lines." Yeah. He's like, "Well, I respect that." It's like, "Thanks, man." So. Not that there are times where sides aren't necessary, you know, because maybe if you have a two and a half page monologue, maybe, you know. And you know how it is. Sometimes you have five hours to prepare, and that's tough. Yeah, or if you, yeah, sometimes you're going between two shoots or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Oh, two shoots? Oh, what's that like? Sometimes, <laughs> I've never done that. I'm just guessing. Oh, okay. I thought you had yeah, done that. No, I've never done that. No, I've never done that. <laughs> well, or, you know, sometimes you get, uh, I've had lines, I've had full, everything, like, changed night before. Yeah, you know? but that's the worst. So. That's the worst. But it is, it is what it is. You know, if you can't do it, someone else will. Yes, and, exactly. Uh, I will say that I've had uh, auditions that they've called me at 9 a.m. on a Thursday and said, they're sending you the sides, you'll get them by 11, the audition's at 3. You're like, oh, God, that's going to be yeah. tough. So, but, you know, if it's something you like, and there have been times where I've looked at the material and I thought, I can't do this. I cannot do justice to the material, and it's a really good director I respect. And I said, I don't want to do it. And they're like, oh, come on. People who are not in this business, they don't understand. They'll say stuff like, oh, come on, just go in there. Just, You'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. No, I won't be great. I'm, first of all, I'll be so far from great, I'm, I'm going to be horrible because I won't know what my lines. I'll be nervous. I'm not going to do justice to the material. And this director I might want to work with in the future is going to remember me as being this horrible, unprepared actor. Right. So, you know, if, if I can't go in and feel like I'm going to do a good job, I just, just not, no, don't even bother. It's not worth it. That makes sense. I think you got to, you know, especially with the whole audition process, which is, is so bizarre to me, but it's always, you know, it's do or die. You got to go in and nail it mm -hmm. and you get one shot, mm -hmm. you know, whereas, and I, and I always, I'm not a fan. Like I like, I think self tapes are so much um, more efficient because you can do them on your own time. Totally. You can, you can make it happen. You can watch it back because that no shoot is ever going to do one take and be like, well, that, we, that's no. all we got. No. So, you know, the audition is an unrealistic, you know, part of the, of the thing. And, mm -hmm. and some, some, some people like that. It's like in the moment. And I think a lot of theater people mm -hmm. appreciate that. But as it people also, that do... So, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, people that do ma mainly TV and film, like, it's a mm -hmm. weird process, yeah. the whole audition thing. And, and some, some casting directors and producers will go out of their way to make you feel comfortable in the room. And I really, that is true. I really appreciate yeah. that. And some, I am convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt, try to make it as uncomfortable to see how you're going to react agree. under pressure. And that to me is so counterproductive. Yeah. Are you trying to hire the most talented person who's right for the part to have an, a wonderful experience on set it, and have this actor de deliver a wonderful per performance? Or are you trying to hire someone who can withstand insane amounts of pressure <laughs> yeah. and just like, you know, not have a heart attack? Oh, he got a job because he didn't, he got the job because he didn't have a heart attack. All yeah, the other yeah, actors dropped out. dead because they were freaking out. Yeah, yeah auditions, auditioning's weird. Weird. It, it really, it's, uh, I'm actually surprised that casting directors are still in business because everything's self-taped now. Yeah, they re know? it really is. I love self-tape. Me too. I do it in my house. I put. I have this little eye flip. I don't even. Have, I do it by myself. Yeah, I remember we were talking about this yeah. one time. You don't even have anyone read no. the other. No, so I, I leave blanks when the other line would be. Right. And you're so relaxed. You're by yourself. Yeah. You know, there's that old joke, man. You should see how many Oscars I have on my fireplace when I rehearse it alone at home <laughs> because you're so relaxed. That, yes. And you know, once in a while, my dog will shake her ears and ruin a take. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> um, but no, that's. I, I like that a lot. It's. Uh, it's just such a weird business. It really is. I, mean, I still am trying it's to figure out what I'm going to do when Weird, I grow up. but um, it has absolutely amazing moments. And it's it so fun. Yeah. I, I, I love it. Um, do you prefer music or acting? It, it's pretty equal. Right now, I, had a, I have a strong acting bug. Mm -hmm. um, like, we're, um, the, the, the music stuff's going through a bunch of changes right now for us. And mm -hmm. um, I'm really loving um, reading and, and going for roles and, awesome. and stuff like that. I'm, I'm having a great time. I'm just so it. happy that you and I will never audition for the same part. <laughs> I well, could be your father. Hopefully, yeah, I was going to say, ho hopefully <laughs> an uncle or a father or, or something. Well, I, I, we got to work together one day because we've become such good friends no, just playing we hockey to. and we do, we're, you know, we're in similar professions. So. Oh, I got to tell you a couple of funny uh, audition stories if you want. Yes, I right. love it. Let's, okay. Yes. So um, this is 2000. Uh, my agent calls me. He goes, "Hey, they are interested in you for this mini series." Is of, this before or after Alias? Uh, good question. Uh, before. Before Alias. Yeah, okay. The year before. So I'm really green. I haven't really done much. And they say it shoots in the Czech Republic for four months. I'm like, Ugh, I'm not a huge traveler, <laughs> you know. I'm, most people would be like, "That's amazing." I was right. like, "No, that's four months away from hockey and my dog and this and that." Um, and it's to play Lancelot in the in the story of you know Camelot and, and mm -hmm. the all that stuff. Um, and they want you to have an English accent, and you have to learn how to ride horses and all this stuff. And I said, I, I don't want to go in. I read it. I was like, no, it's fine. And they said, well, it's Angelica Houston. It's a lot of great people. And I said, I'm not interested. So they convinced me to go in, and unbeknownst to my agent, Lancelot, right? Lancelot. Yeah, yeah. King Arthur. I, I was playing golf about 
an hour after the audition, I literally walked in in my golf polo, <laughs> shorts, and my little cut off golf socks right, with right, my right. sneakers. And the director says, uh, can you do an English accent? I said, eh, it's not, I mean, I can try, but it's not really that good. So if you don't mind, I'd rather not. And he's like, okay. You said, have, have you prepared the three scenes? And I lied. I said, I, I only got one. <laughs> and he said, um, can you ride horses? I said, no, I'm terrified of horses. So I basically did everything I could to not get the job. Right. So I do the one scene. I'm driving out of the garage and I get a call from my manager and he goes, what the hell did you do in there? I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> what? That, was I rude? He goes, you got the job. <laughs> and and you're like, like no! <laughs> No, this can't be happening. Oh my God, that's hilarious. So, cut to two months later, we're in the Czech Republic. You know, after about a week, I got to know the director well enough to be friends with him. I was like, Uli, why, why did you hire me? I, I didn't do anything. He said, you looked dangerous. You looked dangerous. I was like, what, me? <laughs> I'm the antithesis of danger. Uh, but it, it goes to show, it, it's so weird. You can yeah. be so prepared and it, it's just, it's crazy. And the other one was, um, I've forgotten it. <laughs> so I forgot. It was, it was, dude, it was insane. I did everything I could to not get that job. <laughs> got the job. And I can't remember the other one. It'll little, come to you. It'll come to me. It's, it's the uh, prickly pear. <laughs> exactly. And you yeah. haven't cut yet, so just, just to be aware, this is only half a drink. Yeah. Uh, it's all right. You don't have to finish the full thing if you don't want to. Well, Take your I time. Want to. Do you prefer Mike or Michael? It depends on the person. You can call me Mike. You can call me Mickey. You can call me Mikey. I don't care. Um, if some people, I, I feel like you've earned the right to call me Mike. Not I, that, not that it's a big, I, yeah, really, I, just, I really don't care. Uh -huh. But like first day on set, if someone's like, Hey Mike, I'm like, no, it's Michael. Right. It's Michael. Gotcha. Well, a couple weeks from now you can call me Mike, but let's just, we're not there yet. Yeah, okay. I gotcha. Not that it's, you know, I really don't care ultimately, but people have a much more hard time with my last name. They're like, uh, is it Vartan? Is it Vartan? Is it Vartan? It's like it's that it's whatever you want it to be. That, that you. <laughs> I do get a think pass. you have a cool last name. I like Vartan. I I've hated it for a long time. Now I just I'm so used to it that it's right. fine. But I was never. It just sounded weird. I thought it, I always wanted my name to be like Michael Essex or Essex you know, or something you know cool. I think Vartan is really cool. It looks but it looks good on the back of a hockey jersey. But there you, you know, go. <laughs> there's a kid in Vancouver, Jake Vartan, and I'm like that's almost Vartan. Oh. <laughs> um, and you were born in. France? France. Not do you speak fault. French? I do. I do. Oh, like like fluently, fluently. like fully on. First language, yeah. Um, That's your first language. Wow. Mm -hmm. When did you learn English? I kind of learned both things. It's my uh, my mom. It's kind of a cool story. My mom uh, was an army brat. She was born in Poland. Okay. Uh, moved to the states during the war. Lived in Alabama. Uh, moved around a lot. My dad was born in Bulgaria. They met at the Madrid air airport. Oh. They just bumped into each other, and it was love at first sight, and that was it. And five years later, I popped out. And the minute I popped out, they got a divorce. So. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, but so that's been great for my self-esteem. But uh, <laughs> um, no. So growing up, my dad would speak to me in French, and my mom in English. And oh, I that's, actually that's didn't, amazing. It was great. I actually though didn't speak anything until I was about four, because I I didn't. It was like what? Yeah. You know? And then from four to about ten, I spoke English with a French accent and French with an American accent. <laughs> it was a disaster. And then, wow. then around 12, 13, I guess my, you know, whatever part of your brain controls your sounds. And yeah, I was like, okay, the, kicked this, in. Yeah, and so, um, but yeah, I grew up there, dropped out of high school when I was 17, moved back in, to the States. This is in France? France yeah. You, so you went to high school in France? Junior high, it was Junior uh, high. zero to five in France, five to, this is such a, I'm surprised you're not writing this down because it's such an exciting story. Um, <laughs> Five. I'm going to watch it back later. Yeah, okay, worry. cool. 5 to 11 in the States, and then 11 to 18 in France. <clears throat> okay. And then I moved back here to be a slacker, basically. And uh, never wanted to act, ever. I had yeah, when, did, what, when did that come about? My, my mom uh, had a friend, Nick Mead, an English director, who said, hey, I'm directing this documentary on the history of the black le leather jacket that was actually really cool, narr narrated by Dennis Hopper and stuff. And, you know, mm -hmm. the black leather leather jacket during the World War II era and the biker gangs. And I said, I don't know, that's not what I want to do. And he said, well, you have no lines. All you have to do is stand there and look wanky and then you put on this jacket, we'll slick your hair back and you'll drive off on a Harley with this hot girl. And I was like, eh, so I'm, warming, <laughs> I'm warming up to the idea, but no, I'm not interested. He said, I'll give you $600 for two days. I was like, 
I'll do it. I love acting. I acting love is amazing. <laughs> acting is the best job ever. <laughs> and so I did it, and was I was terrible. And I'd never been. How old were you? Probably eighteen. Okay. And then my mom. I was always kind of a loner, you know, um, quiet, shy, not, not kind of Tim- Timothy McVeigh kind of loner, shy, but. Um, she said, why don't you join an acting class? I said, because I don't want to be an actor. And she said, well, there are a lot of p- pretty girls there, and I'll pay for the first six months. And I said, done. <laughs> and so um, I got into it, and then I got this one job um, from one of the guys who was on 21 Jump Street at the time. You're too young to know that no, show. I, I mean, I know because of the, right. cause of the movies. Johnny Depp. Yes. Um, and then I just you know, started getting little jobs here and there, uh, that were really exciting because I'd never done it and it was so like again like I said earlier it was so hard mm-hmm. I guess the competitive side of me just I want to I want to get this right I want to I figure out how to how to do this well and it's been 30 years and I still haven't figured it out but I think you're pretty well you're no but pretty I, good damn job though. thank you but you know how for your personal mm-hmm. you know many times I've done movies where I'm like yeah it was fine and people say oh you were great in the movie and instead of going no I wasn't great stop I know when I'm great and I know when I'm not. I say thank you because you, it's nice yes. of them to say that. But I'd say a good 60 to 75% of the projects I've done, I wish I could do over now. Knowing now knowing, right. what I didn't know then. Um, just because, you know, experience is, uh, you can't really beat experience. There's a famous old acting teacher from New York, I can't remember her name, but she says, it takes 20 years to make an actor. It takes mm. 20 years. Because the first 10 years, you're figuring out who you are, you're figuring out how to not to be nervous, and then the next 10 years, you're discovering how to create characters and, and understand scripts and storylines and all this stuff, and then by the time the 20th year rolls around, you, you've kind of got it all together, and now you're ready to really be an actor. And I was yeah. like, oh, I like that. So I'm kind of on par, I'm on course. There you go, I'm yeah. about halfway yeah. there. I mean, the, the DiCaprio's that come around when they're 14 and do that performance and what's eating yeah. Gilbert Grape, that's... that's that's some somebody it's just like yeah. a natural thing, yeah. and they just totally. it just comes. Like totally. I feel like Eddie Van Halen came out of the womb with that yep. that Kramer guitar. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Absolutely, there's there's, there's a, a select few that for some reason it just clicks instantly. You see these videos on YouTube, like these three three or four year olds playing concert piano. That yeah, that shouldn't happen. Mm-hmm. So there's something else going on in the universe that we don't understand. That and God bless them, it's an amazing thing to see. Totally. Um, I, I, I hoped that, that would have been hockey with me, but sadly, it wasn't. So where did hockey come from? Uh, wait, how did you get into that? Uh, sports is my passion in life. That's my number one passion. Okay. Um, it's take, funny enough, it's taken me a long time to admit that because I was always kind of embarrassed. You know, you go, I go to these red carpet events and you'd be, oh, there's Jack Nicholson and there's you know, some, right. And like, oh, so what is your passion? Oh, well, of course, acting and the arts and. Mm-hmm. Not at all. Uh, <laughs> it's always been sports, but I felt kind of embarrassed to you know, appear like I was a jock or a meathead. And then about four or five years ago, I said, you know what? This is who you are. Just own it. There's nothing wrong with having a passion for sports. It doesn't mean that I'm not an artist also. It doesn't mean right, that I don't absolutely. have any other interests. But if someone said, you'll never act again another day of your life tomorrow, I'd be like, OK, I'll figure something else to do. If someone said to me, you'll never be able to watch sports or play sports again, I would be devastated. Yeah. Because I don't know about you, but hockey to me, and any sport I've played, is when I'm out there, it's the only thing I have in my life where I don't think about anything else. I completely agree. I don't think about my mortgage. I don't think about divorce or bills or my dying dog. It's that, it's just this, it's the most zen. It's, I it's joke, so zen. I joke that it's, it's uh, exercise therapy and church roll into one. Oh, absolutely. It's the most... And I feel bad for people who don't have that release in their lives mm-hmm. because, you know, at least we, two or three times a week, we can go out there and just leave it all behind you and you can just... Oh, I love that. It's I, true. The, it's the best thing when I'm out there. We're a lot alike, mm-hmm. you and I, which I'm discovering more as we, as we talk. <laughs> and I, I'm a, I love it. I'm, I'm, we need, we're going to hang out <laughs> okay, much good. more often. Um, I completely agree, though. When I'm out there, everything else in the entire world just slips away yeah. and all I think about is how do I put the puck in the net right that's all it's the most wonderful simplicity your brain just empties and you're just yeah you have this single singular purpose and it's it's the best and um, I was drafted by a professional soccer team when I was 14 in France really yeah so you're a really good soccer player I was uh, PSG you know them they're, sounds familiar well, anyways they're best team in the world now. They okay. weren't the best team in the world back then, but they're Paris's uh, first division team. And um, I got taken to, I was a goalkeeper. Wow. And I lived in the 
middle of nowhere in Normandy and my dad said I can't you know I can't drive you back and forth and I was like well it's my passion in life I mean I literally had posters of every player my room was just a shrine to soccer it's all I thought about wow. from the age of five on and I do have regrets that my parents weren't more supportive not my parents my father and my stepmom uh -huh. um, if I, I feel like they didn't understand how much I loved it because if they did I really, in my heart of hearts, it's going to sound so arrogant, but you know, when I was 10, I was playing with the 13-year-olds. When I was 13, I was playing with the 16-year-olds. When I was wow. 16, I was playing with the 19-year-olds. And I felt like I was on track to become a professional soccer player. And nothing in my journey would have indicated otherwise. I'm not saying I would have played for the French national team in the World Cup, mm -hmm. but I might have. I yeah. would have definitely played soccer at least in the first or second division, and my life would be very different, but it is what it is. But so that's that's where the sports infatuation came with. And whatever. my first practice at PS, <clears throat> PSG, the goalies practice separately because obviously it's a different kind of position. Right. And they had from you know what was called Le Minim, which is 14 years old, all the way to the to the top team. And I look over and there was this guy Joel Bats who had been the goalkeeper for the French team in 1986. They went all the way to the semis, lost to the Germans two nothing. Let's not go there. <laughs> uh, but I look over and there's the. Uh, the goalie for the French national team who just came back from the World Cup in Mexico City. <laughs> and you're practicing. And you're, you're practicing. You're in with the him. practice with With him. the same coaches. And they're going up and down the line, making us do the same drills he's doing. And it was just like, this is happening. I that mean, is, is so happening. cool. I'm, you know, at, at that time I was 15 maybe, wow. or 16. Um, and I thought, I, I got so excited inside. I was just, it's funny, they were doing simple exercise with the medicine ball, just squatting and right. jumping up. I'd never done that. I, I played in a village team. Mm -hmm. you know, we practiced twice a week, if that. There was never any like actual physical conditioning. It was just practice was go out and play. Mm -hmm. So we do this. I must have done maybe, I don't know, 15 squats. I kid you not, I could not walk for the next two days. <laughs> My legs had never yeah. done that before. It was just like, I, I missed school for two days because I literally could, could not walk. Yeah. And I thought, oh, this is not good. So one, once, it was in the summer, so my dad could take me. So that whole summer, I went and played with them, and it was, it was just awesome. It was just so great, because I felt like, it, it's, it's what I felt, and what I still to this day feel that I was, that's what I, I was meant to do. Mm -hmm. Because my levels of passion for it, um, you know, this, this is gonna sound like it's from a movie, but it's true. Uh, where I lived, we didn't have floodlights on the pitch, because, you know, there's no money for that. Um, and on nights when soccer was canceled because it was raining too hard, I'd go out on the field by myself and kick the ball as high as I could and listen to it and just dive to wherever I thought it was by myself in the dark. Wow. So, and it wasn't because I was training to, I want to make it. I loved it. You just it. loved it. I just it. loved yeah. it. I loved nothing more than com coming home on Tuesday night and being full of mud and <laughs> giving, here, stepmom, yeah. clean this. <laughs> it's, it's, I've never had a passion for anything like like that in my life. And then so I moved here and uh, the NASL had just stopped um, and the indoor league was going on, the indoor soccer league, the play, play in a hockey rink, you remember mm -hmm. that? Which is really weird. And I thought about trying out for the LA team, but I thought That's, that doesn't excite me at all. Um, so that just sort of went away um, and I started acting a little bit. And then around, I was st still a hockey fan th through, through it all. Then around 22, 23, I thought, why don't you start, start playing hockey? I'd never put on a skate in my life. And really? I was 23 years old, I bought some skates, and I went out public skating, and I was the rail hugger, right. you know, trying not to fall. <laughs> and I did that for a good six months till I could finally skate a little bit. And I thought, okay, I'm ready. So I joined this league in Burbank, like, you know, Division 9, and um, played in my first game and realized, oh, I never learned how to skate backwards. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. So that was a problem. So I quit that league, and... I found Paul's league, Paul, the, mm -hmm. the, the league we play in now, and just started playing. I was, I was a second liner until I was about 30. Really? Yeah, and then, and then they're like, okay, you're good enough now. And so from 30 to 38 was my, my peak as a player. I could have, no, I could have never caught you, but I could have gotten in your way a lot easier. <laughs> um, and then, you know, around 42, 44, I felt like oh, I'm slowing down. But I still, it's my, I, I love it. I just love hockey so much because it's, it, it makes me feel the way I did about soccer. It's that same sort That's of, great. it's, it's yeah. I just, I just love it. Yeah, I, I relate to that a lot. And I, I, um, I love hockey mm -hmm. in, the, in that same way. And it's definitely a very high passion of mine mm -hmm. as well. Well, I, I can tell. So. Um, I still think you are probably the best passer out there. Well, 
you know, I, that's very nice of you to say. I don't think that's true, but I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, but, you know, when you can't skate and you can't stick handle and all you can do is pass, you get a lot of practice. At it, so. <laughs> <laughs> I joke around, there's a player that we know well who's one of the best stick handlers out there, mm -hmm. but a terrible passer because he doesn't get enough practice <laughs> passing because he, he never passes. He doesn't, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's pretty funny. I've I've told horrible lies to my agents that I oh I can't make that um, eleven o'clock <laughs> audition at ten o'clock. My mother's sick. Yeah. They're like oh we're so oh. sorry. So, yeah, I, I know. I'm like, I, I, she, she's gonna be fine, but I just need to be be with I her. I just need an hour and a half in Burbank. Meanwhile, she's you know she's in New York doing yeah. her thing. <laughs> That's yeah, I need funny. an hour and a half with her in Burbank. Exactly. <laughs> it's hilarious. That's awesome. Uh, I just I'm I have one more question before we kind of wrap this up, but I'm curious what the um, transition out of Alias was like, because that was a huge, huge show. Was that mm -hmm. Fox? Uh, ABC. ABC, big, big show mm -hmm. on ABC. Yeah. Like I said, my, me and my family, I mean, we watched mm -hmm. everything, and it was such a big part of growing up for us. Yeah, it was interesting because right after Alias, uh, I went to Australia to do a movie called Rogue. That was oh, a, okay. It was a big deal, a crocodile movie. Yep. Rada Mitchell was in it. She was on the, in that movie with uh, Denzel. I mean, it was a really good cast, mostly Australians. Uh, mm -hmm. Shot in Northern Territory for four months. There were the first day I'll remember thinking to myself, what the hell have I gotten myself into? Because we go off on these little boats, and if you hang your arms off the side of the boat, your fingers touch the water, and we're you know, pushing off. It's Honestly, it's 110 degrees at 7 o'clock in the morning with 99% humidity up there. Oh, my it's God. It's insanity. And there are dozens of crocs on the banks of the river with their mouths open just sunning themselves because that's, that's how they keep cool somehow. Uh -huh. And as the boat goes by, they go in the water. And we had, we had two weeks of boat work, and I thought, this is crazy. And, you know, as the shoot wore on, one of the park rangers said, yeah, keep your hands inside because some tourists have been known to be a, a croc has jumped and taken them. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? You just, your gun over there, it's, it's zipped in a sheath. Yeah. And it's unloaded. By the time you unzip it and load the gun and try and shoot the croc, he'll have death rolled me in a log. <laughs> you know, it, it was... It was Dodgy. It was really dodgy. Oh um, my god. But anyway, so I did that movie. Jim Caviezel had been offered the role and he turned it down or something didn't work out. And they came to me in second position right after Alias. And I was thinking, oh hell yeah. <laughs> Career equals skyrocket, baby. <laughs> and so I did that movie. And then I did, um, I can't remember. No, Never Been Kissed and Monster Law were before. But after that movie, I thought, and I made a lot of money on that movie, you know, not, not life changing money, but I, was, I didn't have to think about bills for a solid year. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, I thought, okay, I'm exactly where I want to be. This, for the record, the kind of actor I've always wanted to be is I'd like to make, you know, three, four hundred grand a movie, maybe get on a TV show and just not be super known so you can still go to Starbucks. I've never wanted to be famous or anything. Yeah, you just like steady work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what happened. I think maybe I got a little too picky. Um, one of the producers of Alias, uh, director, pro executive producer, um, Ken Olin, who's an awesome guy, love him to, to death, offered me the Rob Lowe role in Brothers and Sisters right mm. after Alias. And in my infinite wisdom and me thinking, oh no, I think I'm going to do movies now. And, and in fairness, five years on Alias, it, was a, it yeah. was a grind. And the thought of going into another possible, you know, the show could have gone two years or oh, ten. Oh yeah, you I were thought, just like, uh, just like, you know what? That just, makes sense. Hang out with the, uh, Millie, my dog, was th three at the time, um, and I turned it down. It's the only job I regret turning down because that was a game changer. Not at all saying that it, it would have done for me what it's done for Rob, and he was, was amazing, and his career has been fantastic So since then. Um, but I turned down a couple of things that I probably should not have turned down, but I wasn't passionate about them. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, my career flatlined. It was insane. It's, this business is the most humbling it is. If you're not careful about what you do, you've, you've got to be really smart about the, the projects you choose to do or not to do because uh, unfortunately perception and the way people perceive you is often skewed. It's not really, they don't understand you. They yeah. don't understand your reasons for doing A or B. And, you know, I had a, I had a couple, I, I did, I was three years on a show called Hawthorne, then I was on a show called Big Shot. So I, I was still working. And yeah, then, you've had steady work for the whole time. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've, been, I've been fortunate enough to work. Um, and then the last, before the arrangement came along, I didn't work for about four years. Not, I, I did a couple of guest spots here and there, right. but it was tough. And I would tell my manager, what's going on? Where are the auditions? It's like, 
you know, it, it's hard to get you into the room. People just, you know, they're not buying what we're selling. It's like, okay. And I, my ego has never been involved, and I think that's why I've lasted so long in this business, because I really don't care. They don't want to see me, I don't care. Fine. Right. Um, but, um, yeah, the arrangement came along, and uh, it's a funny story. I, I read the pilot, and it was really good. And for some reason, in my mind, I thought it was on A&E. Huh. So I'm reading the pilot. I'm like, this pilot's awesome. It's really good. And they're offering me this really this, this dark character that no one's ever offered me before because no one has imagination in this business. And I can do this really cool, <laughs> like, you know, Machiavellian. Well, he's not that bad. but. And so I called my manager. I said, yeah, I'll do it. He, he said, what? I said, yeah, I, I want to do it. Well, you seem surprised. He goes, I never thought you'd do a show for E! Entertainment. <laughs> and I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm sorry, what? It's for what now? Yeah. It, yeah, it's for E! And I said, ugh. And at the time, I was really bummed. And then I met with those guys and I said, look, we're trying to rebrand the network. We want to really get into script the drama. You know, the reality is still going to be our thing because we're great at it. Mm -hmm. um, and they were so awesome. That entire, entire meeting, all we talked about was sports. They were, <laughs> it was like one of the greatest executive meetings I've ever been part of. That's awesome. Uh, and they said, we'd love to have you on board. Just come have fun with us in Vancouver. And I was like, yeah. And at some point as an actor, you know, and it, it really had nothing to do with the fact that I wasn't working a lot in, during that period. It was... Sometimes as an actor, you can't always go where you want to go. You just need to go where you're wanted. Yes. And they wanted me, and they were really excited about having me on board. And I thought, yeah, go do your thing with them, because they're nice people and they want you. So, yeah, let's do that. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so knowing what you know now mm -hmm. about business and about acting and, and everything, uh, what would you tell your younger self? Like, let's say, uh, you know, right before Alias. What what? What right you, after. What, or, or right after. <laughs> what, what do you wish you knew? <clears throat> I wish I... And I, I'm... You know me now. I'm, I'm not an arrogant person. I don't think anything is owed to you. You, you earn everything you, you get in this world, or especially in this business. Mm -hmm. And it's, in this business, oftentimes, the work you put in never equates to the success because there's so many great actors out there. Totally. But I, I will definitely say that after Alias and after Rogue, um, a part of me thought, I've made it. I, I, I'm here. I've mm -hmm. arrived. I, I, I will get these little parts here and there. I'm, I'm set. And I, it's the, not that I got complacent. It's just that I felt I had this moment of that drive that's like, no, 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 this is, let's keep going, let's go, let's go, let's go. I, I kind of let my guard down a little bit and thought, oh, you know what? No, I'm going to take six months off and float in the pool because <laughs> I can. And guess what? You can't. Yeah. Because while you're floating in the pool, someone else is not floating in the pool and they're auditioning and working hard and bettering totally. themselves every day. So I wish I'd, I'd been a little more aware of what a great opportunity that time in my life was to capitalize even more. Um, and my, my, my uh, agent, who I'm no longer with, <clears throat> excuse me, who was a great guy and a very smart guy, I should have listened to him, he said, Michael, now, now you can get to the next level right now. You know, I'm not saying you're going to be an A-list actor, but you can get to the next level. You can get to where you want to be right now. You just have to put in the work. Because I've been someone who's... I hate red carpets. I hate interviews. I hate, mm -hmm. I hate doing all that stuff because I'm just not good at it. I'm not comfortable at it. It's not in my wheelhouse. I don't like talking about myself, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> but no, this is different. I've known you for yeah, almost we're, 10 years. We're, we're yeah, friends. Yeah, we're so hanging out. It's and, it's, a... and I'm tipsy, so. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that was the one thing if I could do over, I would, I would have just sort of uh, you know, doubled down and really gone after it a little bit harder, um, sucked it up, done a lot of the press things I didn't want to do. Right. Just get your face out there and maybe land a couple roles that really do establish you for the, for the rest of your career. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to now be out of work for four years. So, yeah, when, you're, when, the, when the iron is hot, strike it. Strike it. Is that even a... That's, it's something like yeah. that, yeah. But I, I know what you're saying. You've, but, I mean... Two feathers in the stone can be killed with one arrow? No. Not a clue. No. <laughs> two birds in the... Kill two birds with one stone. I know that. Yeah, I'm totally kidding. I know that one. <laughs> Well, you've done, um, you, I mean, you've had uh, a, a ton of acting credits. You've got, you've worked on a, a, a ton of different, you have a huge range. Uh, have you ever thought about directing? I have, and I think I would be, I think I'd really like it. I think you would too. Um, because being in front of the camera is not, is not my, uh, you know, most comfortable state. Um, and I love directing, and there's so many times on set and not because I'm smart or anything, but just because 30 years in business, I've seen a lot. I've seen, yeah. you know, there are times where I think, why, 
why are we shooting this this way? It would be so much more interesting and economical and time saving if we did it this way. And so much, how about a shot from behind? You know what the scene's at. This whole TV drives me nuts sometimes because it's master, two shot, closer, closer, closer. Yeah. No, just make it interesting. Make a shot. Of, how about a nice two shot that lasts for two and a half minutes and you let the actors act the words that were written on the page? Yeah, I love that. I was channel surfing the other night and it's just a weird movie that I came across. I can't remember what it was, but it was Burt Reynolds and, and some woman. And it was, honestly, it was like, it was a 12 minute scene and it was a two shot. Wow. He was getting ready to go out. They were arguing in the bedroom. And that's the whole thing. It never cut. At one point, he leaves frame to go get his jacket, comes into frame putting on his jacket, and I swear, it was so refreshing. And I, I remember watching the thing going, this is amazing. I, I, I felt like I was getting a, you know, a voyeuristic look into these people's intimate lives. Right. And with this, uh, this culture today is cut, 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 cut. Yeah, everything. speed. So MTV and blah, blah, blah. MTV is from TV. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. Though. You know what I mean. It's, it's like those kind of shots allow the audience's eye to go where it wants to go and now we're forced to look at something because you cut to this, you cut to that. Um, anyway, I think I'd be a good director. So much work though. Yes, so oh my gosh, work. so As an actor, work. you go off, you do your movie for two months. If you're directing that movie, you got... That's like two years. Or three, yeah, you've had a year of prep, you, you're shooting the thing, you've got a year of post and... And let's yeah. talk about editors for a split second. Because okay. editors are the most underrated Agreed. men and women of this business. Yep. I cannot believe... I could never do that. I think I could do that, but it's, I could not spend you know, 10 hours in a room by myself in the dark. It would be too depressing. Looking but, at the same people. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, a great editor can honestly take a bad movie and make it okay, yeah. make it good. And a terrible editor can, get, can take great raw footage and turn it to a complete disaster. Agreed. And it's the one... Um, it's the one, you know, uh, part of the business that is never recognized. Do it like at the Oscars. There's the ed at best editor should be a huge, big, big moment. It's yeah, a big Agreed. deal. You know, because a lot of the directors they're in the editing room for the most part, but some of them aren't at all. That's true. It depends on who it is. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, shout out to the editors. <laughs> shout out to the editors. Well, Mike, I uh, I'm a big fan. Thanks, buddy. Thank you so you much too. for I'm being a, on the show. Yeah, and you know I'm a huge fan of R5. Thank you. I've sent you many pictures of my dog you wearing her R5 beanie. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> we'll have to uh, we'll have to introduce you to the driver era. Yeah. Yes. Um, to but it. seriously, this has been amazing. I feel like we could talk for hours. Yeah, totally. And thank we, you. We'd need another couple of these, but yes, it's it's only Friday. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Thank you so much for Appreciate being on the it. show. My pleasure. Love Thanks you, man. Thank you. Um, it was great. Great it's having you. So good and. Delicious cocktail. It was pretty good. If, you know, know, if the music and acting thing doesn't work out, you could be a. I'll hire you as my personal bartender. Personal bartender. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thanks, man. Thanks, Thanks for being here.